Hello, Positive Filter listeners. It's Phil Wilkerson back with another episode of Positive Filter. I'm joined by a special guest. Everyone's a special guest because they take time to join me on the show. But this guest and I have a lot of intersections uh, in our lives, both personally and fraternally. Uh, and so without further ado, I'm just going to have this guest come on and introduce themselves. And we're going to have a really great conversation about his career in the military and what he's doing to inspire the next generation of military officers. But brother, Sean Lanier, uh, can you introduce yourself? Hey, hello, thanks again for having me on. I'm Sean Lanier, Don Lanier from Alexandria, Virginia. I'm a 24 year army veteran, uh, originally born in Newport News, Virginia, and raised in Petersburg, Virginia, and attended uh, VMI and then spent uh, 20 years in the military at the duty and four in the Guard and Reserves. Excellent. And so, you know, Sean, you've done a lot. You've 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 <laughs> detailed a lot in your career. I think you just also also shared an article that was written about you in Notre Dame. But right now in this current space, you're doing a lot to inspire the next generation. Can you share a little bit about the most recent things that you've been doing in that regard? Well, I mean, I retired in 2015, but slightly before I retired, uh, uh, I was able, one of the few people that was able to actually achieve their childhood dream. I think only like less than 3% of Americans do that. And I actually became a pilot. But toward the end of my military career, when I got here, I realized that flying was a childhood dream, but giving back and helping uh, kids um, get on with their lives and start off careers on their own, that was my true passion. And I ended up um, starting off as a volunteer alumni recruiter, but the mission became much bigger than that. And it started uh, helping kids out overall and using the process that we developed um, over the last eight, eight years, we've helped about 530 kids from 23 states done about $43 million in offers. So um, going to schools of their choices, the only thing we're expecting to do is some type of military or civilian service after they graduate and become part of something that's larger than themselves and give back to the communities that way. You know, and so you said you did that uh, as a volunteer. When did you realize that you needed to scale up and actually create the organization that you've created? Well, once I started getting in the process and I realized, you know, my alma mater is VMI, which is not the right fit for everyone. And for those that don't know, it's Virginia Military Institute. You look it up online, but it's not going to be the right fit for every everybody. But when I started talking to um, teachers, counselors, principals, superintendents and explaining the process, once you start helping a kid get into George Mason, you start helping the kid get into Virginia State University, Hampton University, you know, the Naval Academy or Texas A&M. What you actually started explaining them what the different characteristics and qualities that those institutions were looking for in kids. And then in turn, they we ended up getting better uh, recruits for individual state schools. And that became a much better positive experience overall in you know, completing that circle of getting the kid from high school to college, graduating and becoming productive in life. So once we started getting better fits, and that was like, and it also I did not like the idea of discarding talent. You know, like when a, a school you gets a kid, they apply and they say they don't go with them. Well, where did that kid go? I don't know. Did they go to school? Did they, you know, finish the degree? I was more interested on that, not on the individual school. You know, and I love my alma mater. I'm very proud of my time going there. But if the VMI was not right, not the right fit, and they went to East Carolina University or they went to Women Mary, I wanted them to be just as equally successful because they would be able to contribute back in the community that way with that experience. I love it. I love it. And, then, you know, I think, you know, first of all, we didn't explain what's the name of your organization. I don't think we got to that and, and, and really just, you know, highlight that. And then, yeah, yeah, just also those early years scaling up, you know, what was some of the things that you've learned over time to realize that there is a strong need both on the institution's part and the student's part that you needed to do this formalized organization? Well, my organization is uh, Resolve Solutions Incorporated, or we say RSI, or sometimes we just shorten it, you know, you know how Americans love shortened syllables, just Resolve. Um, so for me, as you started off, when I started looking at nonprofits, I broke it in a little bit phases, like, okay, I understood the process of getting a kid from high school to college, graduate, commission, and then getting employed. I understood that part, but as a nonprofit, what I started looking at, you know, using my and I have a master's in supply chain management. I started looking at the system as a whole and started figuring out where were the areas that kids would fall through the cracks. There's certain things that uh, ROTC scholarship can provide, which is um, you know tuition and um, tuition and fees for college, which equates to about 52 percent in state, 86 percent to an out of state school or to a private school. But what's that delta? 
that you know that out of state enemy um to, uh, room and board costs or that room and board costs depending on where you go that's a significant um debt uh, relative to the family so we started looking at that then we started looking at different uh, educational systems i'm here in the uh you know dmv you know going to the school systems in fairfax county which is one of the most diverse and um you know highly touted in the entire country but you have pg uh, prince william county uh, close by loudon county public schools arlington uh, arlington city schools in uh, alexandria but i go across the river you got dc schools and go a little bit further again pg county howard county charles county so based off of me i can go within 15 to 30 minutes in any direction and have totally different outcomes and students educational basis different uh, degree completion programs you know kids taking honors classes ap classes dual enrollment but when they start from day one at the school they're just a college freshman right or first year student but you know there's different horses that are a little bit further out of the rate uh, you know into the race when they start college and some horses that stuck in the paddock <laughs> and that becomes an interesting so when you have a kid you know that may be struggling from one school they're staying up to one or two o'clock in the morning trying to you know trying to get it in and figure out why am i struggling and their roommate is going to bed at 10 o'clock but he's an electrical engineer studying chinese well it's not because the student is either student smarter than the other the, the student that's electrical engineer in chinese well he may have had dual enrollment he came in with 60 credit hours you know he may have did a study abroad opportunity you know, and, you know, it was partially, you know, uh, you know, not fluent in language, but, you know, definitely comprehended and coming at the 200 level. But it doesn't mean that they can't catch up with each other in life. The problem is that you got that window of opportunity in their freshman and sophomore year so they can be competitive by their junior year. But how do you do that? So if you got the, th you know, the threat of debt, uh, worrying about how to pay the bills, you're getting crushed because your roommate is going to sleep, and, you know, about four hours early before you and chilling and you're struggling, you know, trying to make it. You know it's not that's not necessarily equitable right so uh, you know so that's where we started looking at you know hey what is a nonprofit they can do dod can do certain things schools can do certain things and based off the financially and that varies from institution to institution um some schools out here that if the student gets the rotc scholarship the school will pay for the room and board well that's a huge that's a huge factor but it may not be a huge factor if it's not the right fit socially that is you got a full ride but you don't feel like you belong. So there's a lot that goes into it. So I think that's where I figured out as a nonprofit, you know, we fill in the gaps by trying to provide funding uh, for three programs to help improve the retention, graduation, and commission employment rates. Uh, summer bridging program, get a student on campus before they start their freshman year, have them take three to six credit hours, get them acclimated to campus, teach them how to build a relationship with the faculty, introduce them to some local alumni, um, the second program is summer school. So going to summer school after your freshman year to prevent the, the melt, um, the summer melt. I don't really like to refer to it as summer melt. I think that the melt or the issue that um, what you keep ahead of kids in summer school after your freshman year, you're having them maintain positive time management habits, teaching them time management. If they can get up over, over the summer on their own, get to class, learn how to study, those habits come back over. So when they go into their sophomore year, they're much more confident in themselves knowing what they need to do to study figure out where's the best location on campus to study and do it that way um and then the third program is language immersion where we try to send a student overseas stay with a host family study language for 30 um 34 or 40 hours a week um and completely immersed in the language and that comes from my personal experience because i've i've been overseas half of my military career i've been to 40 countries and picked up about five languages while i was studying uh, while I was abroad, not through formal training, but, you know, stuff like playing stickball street and the kids, you know, uh, running out of the gas, you know, <laughs> fall asleep on the back of the bus in Korea, you know, you're going to figure out how to get home. Right. So, <laughs> so a lot of that stuff that from my own personal experiences and failures, that's where we just looked at this model and say, Hey, how do you get a kid out of high school through four to five years of college with minimal, uh, minimal debt? And we got these great institutions out here providing funds. We got the government, Uncle Sam, providing some dollars. What can we do to make sure that our taxpayer dollars are not going up in flames? I love it. And, you know, I think I don't know if I shared this with you, but, you know, before my father-in-law passed away, he was actually working with a nonprofit called uh, Military Readiness. And what they found and this nonprofit was focused on is if they invest earlier in children like you know, 
childhood ele you know, elementary education that uh, students would be more quote unquote military ready by the time they hit high school because what they found was a large, you know, either they've already been in trouble so they weren't eligible for the military or they weren't in shape. All these things started off systemically as a kid. Mm -hmm. Do you still see that as a generational thing that the high school students are not as military ready, ready as a previous generation ago? Yes and no. Um, the reason why I say yes and no, I think yes, you know, you don't have kids, you know, you know how it was when I was growing up, you know, mom said go outside and go play, right? Mm -hmm. And be home before dark, before the light street lights come on. And you just go out there and run around and do those things. I mean, it, but and I get that kids play now there and you got um you know got automation you got the technology the, the cell phones and that's easy to blame the kids but at the same time you look at the number of kids that are still playing for Alabama schools there's a you know and and competing there are kids that are out here I think that the, the real challenge is that when you look at institutions like you know Nick Saban at Alabama, Nick wasn't coming to the high school to talk to the whole football team. He was coming to get one dude. Mm -hmm. Well, co colleges and university, they have a certain amount of bed space. They're not recruiting everybody. They only think of what's going to fit for them. It's the same thing with DOD. The Army is looking for 60,000 kids out of, out of several million kids per year. So I think that, yes, the larger population may may not be prepared. And that is a national security crisis that we have to face in terms of, you know, um, health wise and those type of things. But for specific institutions that have certain needs, you're not looking for everyone. It's like, how do you find the ones that's going to be the right fit? Because they can't solve those larger issues. That's where you have other organizations that do that. So so as far as staying in your lane, and that's why we focus specifically on kids that want to start their careers in some type of military civilian service it's a niche market i can't solve everyone i don't have the resources and the bandwidth of the staff to do that but this is a critical need as far as our national security national defense you know and providing future leaders and remember you know economically less than two percent of our nation serve but ten percent of small businesses are come from veterans yeah yeah so i love that so do you you know from your experience you know you said your dream job was to be a pilot and you grew up <laughs> Do you still, you know, and I love it. Do you still feel like there's still the same a level of on the kids and still a level of um, desire to serve in the military uh, as the kids? You know, like you're seeing a lot of kids. I want to be in the military. Is that that generationally still there? I think that's. I mean, that's a loaded. It's a loaded question. The reason for it, I think our society has changed. You got to remember when I grew up that aviation was still celebrated. When you look at the stuff mm -hmm. that I was looking at as a kid, you look at the, um, they used to have in the 40s, 50s and 60s where uh, uh, air speed records was broken every week. You saw the um, investment that, was, you know, that NASA was given by the government to get a man to the moon. So I grew up reading those books and seeing those type of things. You also had a lot more community interaction between the military where you had air shows. That's where I got first turned on the aviation. I was about two years old. And you can, you know, you go to an air show, they had an aircraft roped off, do not touch. And you got that little badass little kid running around with the sticky fingers, getting his ping. Well, I was that kid, right? <laughs> Dirty another aircraft, climbing on pilot's leg and stuff like that. But so I think that what I think the challenge now is not that kids aren't interested necessarily specifically the military. They're exposed to a lot more. Mm. I mean, think about it. The shows that were going on in the 70s, 80s, you had 240 Robert, you know, and Blue Thunder and Airwolf. You had shows that had pilots every week, mm -hmm. you know, on TV. Those things are not celebrated. I think if you got a show now, you know, you may have a, a two second clip with a helicopter in the background, you know, but you don't see shows about fighter pilots and doing stuff like that. You know, a uh, mash was on every week. So I think that kids are exposed a lot more, but what they're exposed to is dramatically changed. So that's why when you talk to a kid, the desire to do well at something is still mm -hmm. there. It's you know so now kids are supposed to TikTok videos and you know entertainment culture a lot more than they were were before. I mean, think about it. when I was growing up, you had three channels, right? And in the U channel, you know, U twenty three and U thirty five, and 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 TV went off at twelve o'clock at night with the national anthem. Now you had three hundred plus channels, you know, I mean, and shows that I never even heard of before. Um, so I don't think that the kids in essence are as much different. It's just what they're exposed to any outcomes and that's where talking to them and leading them you know I, every every time i go to a college fair you run into some kid that you know they say they want to do um 
the forensics. I was like, okay, you watch CSI? And they're like, yeah. I was like, well, <laughs> and I was like, well, no, we don't have a forensic science major in school, but we got a bachelor of science in biology. But guess what? You know, you know, on CSI, the guy that comes up there and say, hey, I want to report from the lab, folks. That's the guy that I'm looking for. Can you do that? And they're like, yeah. So the entrepreneurial spirit, the one to be in charge, the one to be holistically solve the problem is still there. You just got to engage them in a conversation and show them, okay, yeah, you can get a um, Bachelor of Science in Biology or do forensics, but ultimately you got to be look beyond just the lab work and see how does it figure into the crime scene and the overall investigation. Do you want to be that one that's solving the problem and, or do you want to be the one that's doing that, that two second clip in the lab, you know, with the quirky comments, you know? And I love it. And what also I love that you brought up and I, I wanted to dive into it is that there's a wide range of careers in the military besides being a pilot, you know, like if you want to be a lawyer, you'd be JAG, right? Uh, you want to be in the forensics or lab. There's there's probably lab work. Uh, I think I've connected with like Naval Research Lab, right? There's yeah. a lot of, so do those, those conversations come up frequently where you're like, all right, maybe it's not the stuff you see on TV, but you know, you got an interest, there's a adjacent role in the military for you. I think you have to kind of guide the target a little bit. You know, for me, when I go out talking to kids, it's a little bit different than going out a recruiter because they're looking for specific numbers. So mm -hmm. I can come at it more from a grandfatherly or your own, you know, the cool uncle type perspective and ask them, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? Because uh, what people don't realize, and this is this power problem has been persistent even when I was in, you know, when I was growing coming up. That, you know, the military is like a Fortune 500 company. You have uh, doctors, lawyers, accountants, yes. you know, st staff, um, managers, HR people. You have all those things in the military. It's just that, you know, there's typically as an officer, there's going to be a leadership component to it. That They're not going to allow you to stay in that job and do the same thing. They're going to expect you to grow um, and be a lifelong learner and continue to develop your craft and become a better leader on top of that. And I think that happens in life. And I think that's one thing that we got to explain to kids as well, that you're not going to do the same thing every single day. I mean, you look at our you know, parents and grandparents that they went to the factory and did the same job for 20, 30 years. Our society has changed. That's not expected. So it's OK to allow a kid to do what they're interested in doing, but teach them about the other opportunities that they can grow into something else. I mean, think about it. I graduated from with a history major degree and a lot of people say oh that's worthless well okay i also became a pilot so i understood about aerospace engineering mechanical engineering um you know uh, weather meteorology you know all of those things but also you know end up picking up several languages in, in there so i ended up doing about transportation i was I got a master in supply chain management before people knew about a supply chain and now people can tell you exactly why that ship is stuck out there why they don't have toilet paper or why they <laughs> they get their gear from amazon so those things have been part of my maturation that i didn't think about yes i wanted to be a pilot that was it but everything else that i grew grew and mature it just you just you start to you continue to evolve as a person a lot of and that's what the military wants for people to grow and evolve and they don't expect you to stay for 20 years like i did hey, you know most of the time people can get out after the initial commitment of three to four years and then they're going to go back, get their MBA or start a uh, start a small business and do that. But you can still have to grow and learn. But it's the skill sets of having led people already that's that you can't take that away. That's the difference. You know, being responsible for others, teaching, uh, coaching, mentoring, managing those folks and, and growing a team. I love it. And, you know, I think you even spoke about the leadership and stuff like that. You are in a lot of spaces, not only with institutions, but employers. And so what are some of the things that you hear that employers need, what skills they want? And then how do you, you know, convey that? Like, let's say, for instance, employers say, I want, you know, leadership skills. How do you convey that to students say, hey, you know, these are the skills employers want. If you have a career in the military, you'll be competitive for these employers. I think it, you know, through our program, we, we talk to kids about this, about becoming a whole person. And it's great. Yes, you got this major, but that's why we talk about doing, um, you know, going overseas after their freshman year. We're not trying to get them to become linguists. We want them to go overseas to get that exposure so they can look at the world as a much smaller playground that they can be a part of. Now, if they they come back and they say, hey, I want to, you know, do something else and take 300, 400 level. I want to study abroad and continue to pursue that language. That's great. We celebrate that. But we anticipate maybe five to 10 percent to do that. The rest of them are going to be much more competitive to go do an internship in a Fortune 500 company 
or in a government sector, you know, in agencies like the FBI, CIA, State Department, those type of things. Either way, you're still building on those the, the whole person concept. And there's uh, after their sophomore year, junior year, and senior year, so they become an officer. But now they've been exposed to different uh, career opportunities. So when they decide, hey, hey, you know, I got a family, I want to stay in one location. I, I met this company, I, you know, I circle back to them. They're interested in me. I'm interested in them, and it works out. Or you can have someone say, hey, look, man, I, I saw the um, I saw the corporate sector and everything. I kind of I'm I'm feeling my thing in the military. I'm gonna ride this out until the brakes wall um, roll off. But what we find the same thing, industry is looking for the same thing as military. They're looking for leadership. And you know, yeah. it is not necessarily the people that are gonna come in and say, I'm gonna be in charge. That's not it. But they're individually be able to maintain themselves, uh, make people feel good about themselves and motivate people around them. Everybody wants that person on their team that their self-starters are gonna come in, not just being on time and showing up, but be able to uh, identify a problem and solve uh, be identify solutions to a pro, uh, an issue before it becomes a problem, you know, because that translates into cost savings, you know? Um, so, you know, so yeah, every corporation wants workers that's going to be engaged, um, intelligent, uh, and then ranging out, looking out forward on helping us solve, uh, solve problems. So that's a you know, valuable member of their community. I love it. And then one thing I was thinking about is that you travel a lot, you know, for your work. And this is kind of a random question. Do you think, is the DMV really, really a military specific area in your travels? And there's, you know, is that just the observation you have? Because I'm, I'm just thinking about it in regards to the people I meet, you know, the veterans, uh, the intersections here at George Mason. This is a very military heavy area. It is. Do you, do you notice that around the country? And then let me ask this too, because this is a very military general, you know, military heavy area. Do you see a lot of the kids being exposed and wanting to be in the military in this area as compared to other regions in the United States? Yes and yes and no. It's, okay. You got to remember 80 percent of northern folks in northern DMV are not from the DMV. Right. Yeah. So and a lot of times when you're dealing with parents and I tell this, you know, kid, you know, I tell parents this all the time. OK, yeah, you you may have incredible health DNA in your blood, but your kid is a DMV kid. Right. <laughs> it's something that takes over. So kids are exposed a lot more. And then, yes, there is a higher concentration in military, but the communities are much more diverse, too. So just because their parents are doing it, they look at their parents and doing something like a nine to five job. They're still rolling with their buddies in a DMV. You know, so it's it's like it's kind of, yes, they've been exposed, but they're not inundated. It's not like there you go to a Fayetteville in Fort Bragg where that's part of such a dominant part of the culture. Mm -hmm. that they talk about it all the time. And I think even in those places that I go outside and travel, even the communities that are have heavily military influence, again, because of what the kids are exposed to, it's much different. You know, they can be right next to the base mm -hmm. and never be on it because if their parents don't live on it, so they're not part of the culture. They're not seeing soldiers running around and doing PT and doing stuff like that. So, yeah, so that's why I say yes and no, because they can be there, but they're looking as far as what's on it in their hand. <laughs> right? yeah. So no, that's yeah. a good point, because I used to remember, I don't know, just it felt like two different worlds when I lived in Fort Rucker, Alabama. As a little kid, I could just notice it as a child. You step off base. It's a totally different world and it yeah. could be a bubble. And some and as you said, people can't penetrate that bubble from the outside. You know, and now even more, if you're not military related, you don't just come on base no more. It's not as open as it used to be after 9-11. Right. So it definitely probably does have a major factor in exposure, even next to the base. Right. And like I said, you got you got your personal bubble. Again, what goes beyond your social media? So you can be right there next to the base, walk next to the fence line, and you know, you don't see it. I talk to kids all the time around here. You know, you think the kids be interested in the Coast Guard because you see the orange helicopters flying up and down. Not if you don't look up. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. And plus, after a while, you know, you get used to the air corridors, the aircraft flying around all times. So it's like completely void. Then you go some other places that they don't have an air aircraft flying overhead unless it's like 25,000, 35,000 feet with contrails. And again, if the kid ain't looking up, they don't see it. So it's really it's really interesting that someone can be right there mm -hmm. and, and not be a part of it at, at all. And also, you know, you said over 500 kids, you know, and I think, you know, this is an audio podcast, so those won't be able to see this good brother, but this is a black man, 
Um, and I'm saying that to say, what about in your time out of the 500, the intersections of diversity within your program? And you really spoke, you really do a good job about this too, is providing access to marginalized groups and other groups that maybe not get a chance to go to college. So can you speak to that? And that aspect of, of the of the of your of your actual organization and in general about the opportunities the military can provide. I think for the audience at large, you got to understand that I've gone through this with some alumni. You know, I go with the coalition of willing, the ones that's willing to volunteer. Schools were desegregated a few decades ago, so you can't go in looking for a certain race, right? <laughs> you know, you, mm -hmm. you go into school, you play what you get. Now you can look at the statistics of the schools um, and look at the demographics and do that. And I tend to go to more schools that are, um, when I was recruiting for VMI, I looked, at, I looked. it wasn't where they were going. I was looking at where they weren't going. And I mm -hmm. focused, focused there because there was no sense in double tapping there. And that's the same thing when I volunteered for part of the West Point Field Force and look at, you know, you look at where they go, look where are the areas that you're not going. Because the problem right now with recruiting, one of the issues is that there are more there's always been more kids than there are recruiters right there's more kids than there are veterans and if you don't have those folks out and involved in the community you're only getting a fraction of what's out there uh, uh, you know so that's where i looked at it's like okay where are people not going what are the organizations that have um have they have kids that's why you know with dod not partnering with you know organization like the divine nine i've always scratched my head because you know when you talk about alpha achievers you know, Kappa Lee, Delta Gems. I mean, they got kids already. When you look at Jack and Jill, well, their kids are being programmed to go to college. Why aren't you talking to them? Or Top Ladies of the, uh, Distinction, they got their Top Teens of America program. Their kids are going to college. So it kind of makes sense to, you know, look, this is not rocket science. My uncle was a master chief in the Navy. First time he took me fishing was in Waco, Texas. Uh, he was from Dallas to a stop pond with catfish. And guess what? I put stink bait on, on the hook. I was catching fish within three minutes. So I never learned about fishes, about patience and waiting. No, if you, you go where the fish are biting. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So it didn't make sense. Like, this is not rocket science. You know, if you go to the organization, the people who have access to kids that are mentor kids, 100 Black Men of America, a coalition of 100 Black women, you know, in the Boys and Girls uh, Boys and Girls Club, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, some organizations get a lot of looks, you know, Boy Scouts of America, Girl Scouts, you know, larger organizations. But what are the organizations that have fingerprints on kids that you're not talking to? Again, that's that's why I said it's a lot of stuff is not you're not you know, you're not recruiting the whole high school football team. You're looking for one dude, one dude that if you find two great, that's a bonus. <laughs> I love it. And then also just recently, I mean, you do definitely do that because you particularly go to Bea or Nesby. And I saw that you went to the Southern region, particularly, and they had a career fair. Yep. Uh, what was the rationale for those spaces? And 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 just, is that kind of like the re the reasons that you shared earlier? Well, Bea, uh, for the audience out there, um, Black Engineer of the Year or um, Be Everything You Are, is this three-day STEM conference that takes place the second weekend in February, normally overlapping Valentine's Day on the Thursday, uh, Friday, and Saturday. But the reason why I try to have kids to come there and get them exposure, I mean, I think I had 22 cadets from BMI that came up there, four from Howard University, uh, Army ROTC, uh, four from the Air Force, uh, some cadets from Delaware. We also had some cadets from Naval Academy, Air Force Academy, and West Point to go there. Well, because they got 70 plus companies there that's looking to get kids internships. So that makes sense to get them exposed. If you've already had them going through college, being successful, they're young, they're in shape, they're walking erect, <laughs> they're very articulate. So a lot of those employers are looking for those kids, right? And I even used to, I go through this every year with kids at BMI, I'm like, oh, I'm wearing my, wearing my uniform, I want to blend in. Hey, God, this ain't the time to blend in. This is time to stand out. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then every time we take them up there and they wear the uniform and people be grabbing them. Hey, what you going to what you going to hear? They're like, oh, man, I'm so glad I wore the uniform. Now, of course, they don't tell me. They whisper to their buddies. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but same thing with the Alpha Southern Convention. They got reached out by a good brother there telling me about the event. Um, I pitched it to, um, you know, my I'm out of VMI. You know, for them, they said, hey, they were in a, uh, like a lot of institutions. Admissions officers do not have an unlimited budget. You know, for like travel, marketing. 
So they say, hey, look, you know, we don't, it's not in our budget. So I went on my own. I mean, I had some airline miles, <laughs> airline miles for the hotel, uh, picked up a rental car, but they had 1,500 to 2,500 kids there. I think I walked away with over 30 cars with, you know, with half of the kids having GPAs between 3.5 and 4.375 GPA. So for me, in my alma mater, VMI, that kid, that type of kid is worth a, a RTC scholarship and VMI is 62,000 a year. So that means the ROTC scholarship is going to pay fifty thousand a year. That's a two hundred thousand dollars scholarship for what? Fly down there the day the night before the event, stay in a hotel, go to the event, talk to kids for three hours, and you're walking away with 30, 30 contacts. Even if I got ten, that's two million dollars worth of scholarships. And that's one of the challenges with a lot of institutions. And you know, when people say, "Hey, it's not in our budget," it's not what you have in your budget. It's really what are you losing? You lost two, potentially lose ten, two million on the low end, and and revenue and tuition and fees, versus a plane ticket, which is like maybe two, uh, two, three hundred bucks if you purchase it in advance, a rental car a hundred bucks, and a stay in the hotel for another two hundred. You know, so those are the decisions that they have to make, and I think that a lot of times people don't look at it that way because they, there's this notion of well, you never miss what you never had. Well, that's not how business works. <laughs> You know, especially with, you know, for profit business, when you look at you tell your, you, you know, if you went to your shareholders and told them that, guess what? That the CEO is out of a job. That CFO is out of a job. But when you talk about academic institutions and everything, that's where some of the challenges that some of these presidents have to start challenging these admissions offices and saying, hey, I, yeah, you get the bottom line. But where are you going fishing? You know, because there's there's you know, there's fish out there to be had. And, you know, so that's where and that's the way we kind of look at it. So scaling up. For us as a nonprofit, we looked at it and I've been to about 40 events in over 20 cities since last January. So we have a really good idea of where to go, uh, which organizations to partner with had to have a, a type of quality, character and value uh, of kids that they bring to their table from there. And then it's just connecting the dots and figuring out what's the best uh, institutions that's best fit for them and where they're going to be competitive to get as most money to pay for that school while they're there. I love it. I mean, and you have so many success stories. I see them all the time. I see that you highlight your student success stories. And I'm pretty sure this is, a, I mean, it's not an impossible, it is an impossible question. Like, you know, cause like you can say, which one is your favorite? So I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to say most recently, what is one student success story that's really just resonated with you recently? Cause I, as I said earlier, you have so many stories you can pull from, but one just recently that comes to mind. Well, for all the kids out there, I post the stories because they share it. Because kids are like um, loose marbles, right? Once they get into college, they don't always keep you informed. So you have to kind of sneak around, watch the social media. And there are a lot of them doing some great things. So it's not like the ones that we post, they shine out anymore. They're just the ones that share their story uh, with us and we share with a larger audience. But, um, you know, I would say that, the you know, the couple of stories that are the most significant right now, the ones that are actively happening, you know, uh, Heavenly Simmons, who is a sophomore at uh, Howard University. She's from Warner Roberts, Georgia. Um, got a three-year ROTC scholarship to go to Howard, but we talked about going overseas and, you know, to kind of tickle her fancy. She applied for Project Global Officer, was sponsored by DOD, and spent four weeks in Oman, Jordan. Uh, we then sent her over to um, Dubai, UAE, three weeks after that for language immersion, which is a much different experience than cultural immersion. So it was more of a sink or swim type of thing, but she got, she got her butt kicked, but she still wanted to go to additional countries, but she ended up using that experience and growing from that to come back. She did an internship this uh, first semester of her sophomore year with Congressman Connolly of Fairfax, Virginia. And then like two weeks ago, she's briefing the Army G G2, Lieutenant General Hell, because they took a team of uh, they took a team of kids um, over from Howard University, the PMS, uh, who is also uh, for at Lieutenant Colonel Jonathan Coe. He took a group there and she's up there and you can see in the pictures, she's taking notes sitting right up there. But that comes from the confidence of having been in a congressman's office, having been overseas. And then when you're talking about a sophomore. So what's she going to do the next two years as a junior, senior, once she really figures it out, what she's capable of. There's like, I mean, you know, so that story is to be told. Hopefully she goes overseas this summer. We found the master's in, um, in economics to NYU that's in Abu Dhabi that, you know, hopefully she can, compete for that but that's what we want and another story if you don't mind is um a, a laundry uh, 
Alondra Diaz. You know, she's a sophomore as well um, at Penn State University. But Alondra, you know, it was a little bit longer plan. She wanted to be in my officer. So we sent her to Lisbon, Portugal last summer. So that will be should be competitive for Project Global Officer this sun, summer uh, to study Portuguese in Brazil. When we send to Brazil, hopefully she gets picked up for the Bourne Award. And that way she can study the first semester of her junior year, Arabic in a foreign country, come back, do her uh, second semester of junior year, go to her RTC advanced camp and then go back overseas and then come back and prepare to take her LSATs because what you want to do is she can then graduate commission. And then, you know, uh, with her and Alondra is a first generation American Honduran descent. Right. So Spanish was already there. You add in Portuguese to get her exposed to Arabic. She becomes an MI officer or a military intelligence officer for um, two, three years. And then she can apply with her LSATs that lasts for five years. She can apply to law school and have that fully funded. And oh yeah, by the way, you still got agencies like CIA, FBI, State Department whispering, you know, um, and say, you know, Defense Intelligence Agency, hey, psst, look over here, look at us, look at us. But that's what you want kids to have to have skill sets and confidence that other people see value in that and say, hey, I want that person on my team. I love it. I love it. I mean, it's just really inspiring. Um, and so I, I, I kind of got you. I said the last part of our show is called shot, shout outs and plugs, but we're going to do a segment called shot for shot where you get to ask me any random question. I get to ask you any random question. You want to go first? Or I go first. You go first. All right. So you met my, tell me about the first time you met my dad. Why is that significant? <laughs> and I will share this with uh, him this episode, but that is my random question for you. All right. The first time I met your dad, uh, Eshawn when there was a second lieutenant in Fort Rucker, Alabama, I had got assigned to, uh, to fly Apache helicopters. And, you know, all the folks I hear this frustrated with Congress, government shutdowns have been going on for a long time, and there's always a trickle-down effect. So I ended up losing my, um, the government shutdown, I lost my Apache uh, helicopter slot to start training the day before, uh, I found out on a Friday, like I was supposed to start that Monday. So they, I got put into a holding pattern and they sent me to go work in the garrison commander's office at then Fort Rocker, Alabama. So I walked to the office to go report in and introduce myself. And um, I walked in and, you know, it's a colonel's office. And, you know, and then I see I look at the f in front of this desk and there on the floor is this um, little um, display plate that had like a VMI cadet. And I say VMI. It's like, oh, OK, then that's that's what's up. All right. I'm being my mom. Cool. And then I looked up and I looked around the room and I saw all these Buffalo soldiers paintings. I'm like, <laughs> all right, this ain't adding up. You know, one plus one, uh, the one plus one is equaling three. This is not, this is, this math ain't math then, right? So I might, like, when I come there and say, and I heard this, <clears throat> uh, yes, can I help you? And I turned around and I looked at him, obviously African-American colonel, and I looked at the name Wilkerson and as a history major, I knew about the first uh, African Americans that went to VMI. I was, I'm like, oh, you're that dude, right? Totally lost the composure, military composure, military bearing, all that was going out the window. So that's how I met your dad because I was assigned to work in the garrison commander's office while the army figured out what to do with me. And I, uh, they end up finding me, end up telling me to um, fly black helicopters um, instead of Apaches, which was unfortunate. Me, it was it was cringeworthy because the day I started the blackout course, the Apache opened up and I was trying to switch back over and they wouldn't do it. So if anyone out there who knows, there's a difference between mentalities between a blackout helicopter and Apache pilot. <laughs> so. and that's crazy. Small world, right? The the, the, uh, the intersections of life and just knowing who just running into people. All right. What's your question for me? Well, my, my understand if I read correctly, how did you meet your wife? And how did that tie in it towards Mason? Because you guys, I think I saw an article. Okay, so so the, the Mason part has nothing to you know to do with our relationship. Maggie went to West Potomac, I went to Mount Vernon, and then coincidentally, uh, we lived parallel from each other, like a mile from each other, but didn't know each other. I should have went to West Potomac, but I did the IV program at Mount Vernon. Okay, and then the summer going into college, uh, we met. And I would say the rest is history because I always wanted to go to JMU, but my grades was boo-boo. And I, I can admit that now. I'm always a smart kid, but I just was underachieving. I was an intelligent underachiever, uh, but I went to Bowie State first. She went to JMU. 
and then I transferred to JMU, and the rest is history. Oh, now, it was JMU, not George Mason. That's what I mean. Yeah, saying. JMU. But I will tie in the Mason part because it does have a – now that I'm thinking about it, while I was at uh, – J, my wife's a social worker, and during her whole time, she was like, Philip, you know, you should be a social work major with me. And I was like, there's no dudes in that program. No. So I studied history, literally. But I like working with people. So the first job that I got when I graduated was at a school with children with special needs. And I realized I did like working with people. And roundabout way, I didn't get a, a master's in social work, but I got a master's in counseling, which is a helping thing. I could have done a master's in social work all along, but I need to find my way. So I did that at George Mason. So I get, you know, roundabout way, that was my destiny to get my master's and help people, even though my wife said I should have done an undergrad in social work at yeah. Jamie. My apologies. That's what it was. I saw the article. Y'all were in a contest for Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the jam you love. Yeah, we were trying to win. We got we got second. They still gave us a gift card. Shout out to them. Uh yeah. gift card that we're gonna use. But uh yeah, it was down to the wire, man. We we were trying to get people to vote for us and all that stuff. Uh, the, the girls, the, the the leaders just blew us out the water. They had like 600 votes, something crazy. I was like, all right, we can't. Win. Yeah, we I've been through I went through that. Um, we were um, recipients. We came in third place for a competition for um, veteran organizations through Pen, uh, PenFed, uh, Pentagon Federal Credit Union. And it's uh, getting votes and through social media. That's a whole job. You need a whole team in order oh, yeah, to I was, I was spamming people, sending a link to everybody. And then I would check in. I'm like, how am I still behind 300? <laughs> like, 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 it was crazy. They got bots. Or something. I don't know. I'm just joking. But like, it just like it was, it was, it was competitive. Well, Brother Lanier, this has been a great episode. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this is the part of the show called Shout Outs and Plugs. So shout out, show love to anyone you want to show love to, anyone. And then plugs. These are the resources, the things that you're working on that you would want me to include in the show notes so that I can share with my listeners when I upload this episode. But the stage is set. Shout outs and plugs. Well, definitely like to send a shout out to uh, University of Notre, Notre Dame, the Idea Center. They ran an article on us that came out yesterday. Um, love for people to check it out and read it. Um, you know, um, definitely um, the writer did a great job just capturing our story, story to the best of her ability to kind of translate the why. Because a lot of people try to figure out like, well, why are you helping kids that you don't even know? And you'll tell that a lot of the, our organization was based off experiences that I had or what I learned from other students not making it or students that were far better than me that dropped out for one reason or another that didn't disclose. So those lessons learned have culminated into our, our business model here at RS, uh, RSI. And then definitely like to um, give a shout out to all the other mentors out there that have been supportive over the years, Lieutenant General Gwen Bingham you know uh your pops you know a lot of other folks out there uh even in the article you see my interactions with general david petraeus there have been a lot of people along the way you know general johnny wilson's and guys there have been people along the way that people never met that are great americans that you know just exposed to them thinking about you and oftentimes when you're around people they often see something in you that you necessarily don't see in yourself and having that you know that exposure to put folks that that kind of believe in you just didn't throw you out you know that means means a lot so definitely uh shout out to all the folks and, and there's a lot more people that had fingerprints on isha lanier over my 20 plus year military career and even you know i i enjoy it now because there are so many other people that's uh, touching these kids and you know helping them get to the next level and you know um you know uh, and just uh looking at them and looking at them as the future leaders that they are and trying to help impart some of their wisdom with them. So I appreciate that. So you can see a lot of these uh, stories on our LinkedIn, my personal LinkedIn page. We have a professional link, uh, LinkedIn page for RSI. You also see us on X, um, Instagram as well. Uh, so there are a lot of stories and more stories to be told. We sent three kids overseas last summer. Uh, we're gonna have a fundraiser here on the 18th of April uh, to try to send about 30 kids overseas this summer. So you, when you think about the stories of Heavenly, who I mentioned earlier, they went to, Jordan UAE or um, Heavenly, I mean, excuse me, Alondra that, you know, went to Lisbon, but now is getting ready to go to Brazil this summer. Imagine if we have, you know, 15 to 30 kids like that on um, five or six different continents and then coming back and contributing. Uh, what would they do in their sophomore year, junior year? And then when one day pen on those bars and graduate and represent their alma maters, both high school and college in our nation, in their communities. Is that, just kidding, real quick, can you give an explanation? Is, is the fundraiser an in-person fundraiser? Can you do a little bit about that so we can make sure to elevate that? 
Uh, we're still in the developmental phase of that, but right now it's going to be a small event of about, you know, probably about 50 folks that's going to be down in the ALS uh, community down in Old Town, Alexandria. From there, there'll probably be another virtual portion. Um, I did the initial ask, we would probably try to raise about $25,000 to an initial campaign. But because kids don't fly until June, we're probably going to extend that out. When you talk about 30 kids, $7,000, that's really, you know, a, a piece. You know, you're really talking about, you know, 200000 plus that you raise. So there's going to be the initial, uh, the initial phase. And then we're probably going to have, you know, and uh, uh, like I said, by April 18th and then throughout April, May and June, we're going to still try to uh, raise to send as many kids as possible uh, overseas to have these experiences. So they can then come back and go to uh, the Bay of Conferences, NSBE Conferences, National Society for Black Engineers, Society you know, Society for Women Engineers, the Society for Hispanic Professional Engineers, all those organizations that have internship opportunities for these kids uh, kids that have recognized their talents and uh, give them an opportunity to get them exposure and then that's what we're what we're trying to send them off to and tell their stories through them i saw it so just keep us posted and i'll definitely put all the resources in the show notes well positive filter listeners has been a great episode as you know every episode is dedicated to the memory of my late father-in-law jeff kirsch so i put in the show notes the jeff kirsch anti-hunger fund Additionally, I'm just doing this now and I might be doing this for the rest of the podcast. If you're interested in spreading kindness throughout the Mason Nation, if you're a George Mason uh, part, uh, uh, affiliated person, please consider submitting a Pats for Patriots, which is a simple program to send an e-card to someone that you want to show love to. In regards to the podcast, please share this episode with a family member or friend. Please elevate this by giving it a rating or review on Apple or Spotify. Please share this episode, pass it around. The, only, the way that this podcast grows is through your support. So thank you so much. And thank you for joining us.